be back again. It's been a fast year, to be honest with you, since um, just this time last year, we had the talk on Father of yeah. And uh, I was just thinking about that this week. Oh my God, what, what a year. So what I have to show you this evening is it's a kind of a guided tour through time and through space. So it's old views of monuments in Sligo. And it's something I became interested in during the, the lockdown. Um, we had a lot of time on our hands for research. So I spent quite a bit of time looking up old photographs of Carol Moore and I found quite a lot of them, which I'd never seen before, and Carol Keel. And I also did a good bit of uh, some courses on um, uh, Photoshop and, and photo manipulation. So I've colorized quite a few of the old photographs of Carol Moore as well. So we'll see what you think. So I have a few anyway, I have about 50 or 55 photographs and I won't spend too long on each one, but it's a kind of a guided tour, I suppose, through time and space, you could say, really. So is everybody ready to go? Seat belts on and whatever. So can you all see the first photograph there, which is of Dolman number seven at Carrow Moor? And that is the oldest picture I have to show you here this evening. Uh, that picture was, uh, that's, a, that's a copy of a painting of the Kissing Stone, as they call it in Carrow Moor, Dolman number seven. And that illustration, the original was done in 1779 by Gabriel Beranger, and his work was all copied by Austin Cooper. So this is from about 1789 or so. And it's a watercolor of the Kissing Stone at Caramore. And um, it's a copy of a watercolor, I suppose. So the oldest anyway, just over 230 years old, that image. And you might find the Dolman 7, anybody who's familiar with it, actually looks a little bit strange in that picture. It's been a little bit flattened by the screen here at the moment, but I've actually gone and re-photographed most of these monuments at work. And you can actually find that view of Carrow Moor. Um, you have to go up one of the fields. It's not, it's not the normal view you would see of that monument. You know, it, it might be a bit unrecognizable, but it, is actually, it does actually look like that from a certain angle. So anyway, that's the first or the introductory photograph. Now you'll be seeing quite a few pictures of that monument because it is considered to be um, the best example of a monument in Carrow Moor. And it certainly is the, uh, the most photogenic or photographic one that's left. Now, this is another picture of the same monument. And this picture is from 100 years later. This was by Charles Elcock, and he has a date and it is the 29th of the 7th, 29th of August, 1882. Now, Charles Elcock was um, a gentleman, he was a Quaker who was from Yorkshire originally, and he moved to Belfast and he got married in Belfast. He was an artist by trade. He made slides from microscopes or microscopic slides. And he was a member of the Belfast Archaeological Society or the Belfast Field Club. So he would have been down in Carrowmore, possibly on field trips, but he fell in love with Carrowmore and he fell in love with Sligo. And um, that's one of the watercolours that he did. And I always find this one interesting because I remember learning years ago that um, antiquarian researchers, when they draw pictures of monuments, um, they would often put a person in the picture, but they would often make the person smaller than he would be in actual life to make the monument look bigger and more imposing. So the gentleman in this picture here that's looking at number seven would be about the size of a hobbit because if, if I was standing beside that monument, my head would be up to the level of the top of the capstone. So just this gentleman here in the photograph is three and a half to four feet high and that's to make the monument look much bigger and more imposing. Anyway, it's a fabulous um, picture of Carol Moore. It's one of my favorites that I've seen. He's compressed the background very interestingly. You can see Ben Bulvin there over the gentleman's head, um, but he's kind of moved the background right into the middle of the picture. And you can also see some stones over there on the left of another one of the monuments in Carrowmore. Now that is um, Charles Elcock on the left there. He was a Quaker, uh, I think he was a minister. Um, and he spent, in, in the 1880s, he spent quite a bit of time in Carrowmore. The gentleman on the right here is um, William Wakeman, William Frederick Wakeman, and I have quite a few pictures of his as well. Wakeman um, was born in 1822 and he worked for the Ordnance Survey. He was a kind of a, a student of, of George Petrie, the famous Petrie, who was the first person to map Carrowmore properly. And Wakeman was employed by the Ordnance Survey and then he made a career for himself. He was an art teacher when he was stuck for money, but um, he wrote several handbooks and archaeology books um, and quite a famous archaeological researcher. So he kind of had his own niche, I suppose, Wakeman. So Elcock, um, his, as I said, his job was he made microscopic slides. So he did these incredibly small um, detailed watercolors of ferns and spores and things like that, whereas Wakeman 
actually specialized in monuments. Now, this is one of the photographs I discovered they're in the National Museum of Northern Ireland. There's a huge collection of photographs by two photographers, uh, Robert Welsh and William Green. And Welsh, uh, I'll show you a picture of him in a few minutes, but um, Welsh was one of the most famous photographers in Ireland back in the Victorian times. And he visited Carol Moore around 1880, 1896. And he um, left quite a decent um, selection of photographs of Carol Moore and they're very very interesting because you can see details in them. This is one of the ones I've colorized and the colorization tends to bring out some of the extra details in the photographs. So you may be able to see just to the right of the capstone of the Kissing Stone you can see Crohan Mountain which has a cairn up on the summit so you're getting the views from Carol Moore in there and also right over on the right hand side of the picture you can actually see Dolmen number four which is the, the cromlock of the Phantom Stones as um, Elcock like to call it. And at the bottom of the picture we have Labanafian, Kissing Stone, Cromlock and Stone Circle, Caramore, County Sligo, and you have Robert Welch's initials. And the numbers that usually go by the initials are the number of the slide he took. It's nothing to do with the date, but people often see them and they think that they're looking at the dates. So there you have a nice photograph of the Kissing Stone around 1896. And you can also see the girl here. We, I was doing a bit of research on her back last year and the families, as you see several people in these photographs and uh, trying to identify them. And it's a project I must get back to. So that's the Kissing Stone. It's one of the most photogenic monuments in Caramore, as I was saying. So there you can see um, Welsh took another photograph of and he has the little girl in the picture again as his model. It's a thing that you find Welsh and Green like to do is um, they like to bring the local people who were living near the monuments and they would get them out and they would have them in for scale. So where Elcock was reducing people to the size of hobbits, um, the, the, the other two gentlemen were quite fond of getting children to pose in their pictures, which again makes the monuments look much bigger. So that's the same monument again, Caramore number no. seven or the Kissing Stone. And here we have it yet again, because as I was saying, it's one of the most photogenic monuments in Carrowmore. And this gentleman sitting on the stone here, we think maybe John Parks, who was living in one of the cottages in Carrowmore. And I think his great grandchildren are still living in Carrowmore. The Parks family are still there. And they were the landowners at the time. So they probably came over with um, Welsh to bring him over to the monuments and show him. You find in a lot of these pictures, it seems almost as if the locals were giving tours to the, the wealthy gentleman maybe down from Belfast to take photographs. So you can see anyway, I think he's John Parks. He's sitting on one of the stones here um, in the circle at the Kissing Stone. And again, this only showed up when I colorized the photograph at right to the right of the picture. You can just make out the peak of Crucon Mountain over in the Ox Mountains as well. Now this one here is circle number three at Carrowmore. Um, this is the notorious one, I suppose, from Bjornholt's um, excavations. This is the monument where he claimed he had charcoal that dated to 5,400 BC. So it became quite a notorious monument um, for quite a period of time. And you still do find when you look on, online in other places that Carrowmore, you have the oldest monuments in the world and the oldest freestanding structures or whatever, but we don't um, take Bjornholt's dates too seriously at Carrowmore. And this monument is much more likely to be from maybe around 3,800 BC rather than around 5,400 BC. Anyway, in this photograph here, we are looking towards Knocknaray, which you can't see um, it's behind the trees over here. But the cottage has been knocked. It was demolished by the OPW um, all back at, uh, around 20 years ago. But the cottage was just opposite the visitor centre. So if you were to look to your left here you would be able to see the visitor center just across the road. The road is out running parallel to us here and you have the stone circle from um, monument number three and it has a wee burial chamber at the center. So what's so interesting about this picture is you can see the thatched cottage over here and you can see the slated roof on the sides and there is actually the head of, um, oh I can't remember the lady's name now but she's possibly John Park's wife and this is a picture that's taken by Green and we think Green was in Carrowmore around 1910. So this photograph would be taken about 14 years after the photographs that Welsh took at the same monuments. So it's very interesting to see how the two of them followed each other. Um, Green was a student of Welsh's. He was his apprentice at one stage. And in his journey around Ireland, when you look at their two collections of photographs, 
you find that Green generally went to places where Welsh had been already, and he often took his photographs from the same angle as well. But that's what's so interesting about this monument here is we have the lady standing, and she's actually standing on Circle One in Carrowmore. So that cottage there that you can see in the photograph, the first monument, number one, is just out beside it. And um, she is standing up on top of one of the curbstones, looking back over the hedge and watching William Green while he's taking his photograph. So it's a very interesting social document as much as anything else. Uh, this is probably my favorite of all of these photographs. And this is the same little girl again. Um, I have a feeling her name was Kate from, it's, it's quite a while since I looked into it, trying to figure out who she was. Um, this is a photograph that was taken by Robert Welsh. Again, you see his signature down below. And this is the Cromlock. It says Cromlock, Caramore, Sligo, height five foot. Petrie's number six, Robert Welsh. Um, this is the photograph, this is the, the, is the monument that Elcock, who, who named two of the monuments in Carrowmore, so he named the Kissing Stone, is what he liked to call number seven, and this monument here he liked to call the Phantom Stones, and you find that in some of the photographs, it's listed as the Phantom Stones. And another interesting thing in this, in this photograph here is you can see the stone wall to the back of the dolmen, and that wall is still there in Carrowmore, this is monument number four and monument number five, you can actually see some of the large stones, which um, the, the curb stone at the Phantom Stones was demolished around 1840. The stones were buried and they're still there underground in a ring around the dolmen. And that's why it's called Phantom Stones. But the monument next door to it was demolished and it was used to build a field wall. And you can actually see some of the curb stones just to the right of the little girl there in the wall. And that is another destroyed monument. So like I say, very interesting um, social um, history here in these photographs as well. Now this one here is a much, much more recent photograph. And I just threw it in this evening. I was just looking through to see, was there anything I'd left out? And this is the same monument again. This is the Phantom Stones at Carrowmore. Uh, it's very hard to make the monument out here because of all the ploughing, but basically the ring of stones has been buried underground here around the monument. Now this photograph is from Michael Herity's Irish Passage Graves, and this photograph would date to uh, the early 1970s. So you get an idea of the amount of um, ploughing and um, you know the, the amount of agricultural work that was going on in Carrowmore up until quite recent times. That photograph is probably from around 1970. The book was published in 1976. So that's one of Michael Herity's photographs. Now, these are the two gentlemen. I've been showing you some pictures of them. On the left, you have Robert Welsh, who is, I suppose, a senior statesman of, archae of archeological photography in Ireland. Um, there's a huge collection of his um, slides in the National Museum of Northern Ireland. I think something like 4,000 uh, photographs. And there's two or 300 photographs of monuments in there. So there's some really, really interesting to see how some of these monuments have changed or how interested these people were in traveling around and visiting these monuments. So that's Welsh on the left anyway. Um, his, his big job was he was the official photographer for Harlan and Wolfe in Belfast. So he would have taken many photographs, for example, of the Titanic. And there's, there's, quite, there's a whole series of photographs he took of the Titanic leaving Belfast Lock. And to the right here, you have William Green, um, a few years younger than Welsh. Um, couldn't really find out that much about him. This is him in one of his own photographs. He's kind of a serious looking gentleman. I do know he had some kind of a family tragedy in the 1920s. I think around 1922, his only son died and he seems to have given up photography, I think by about 1930. But he traveled all around Ireland and he sold a lot of postcards and he had a series of postcards called the Wagtail um, um, series. And that was a play on his initials, um, W.A. Green, William A. Green, so the Wagtail. So anyway, that's the two gentlemen who's Largely, um, whose photographs you'll be seeing here. Now this is going back a little bit. This is one of William Wakeman's um, illustrations and Wakeman was hired to do a series of uh, illustrations of monuments in Sligo around 1879 and 1880 and he did two fabulous sketchbooks full of photographs. One of them has about 35 or 40 monuments from all around Sligo and that's what this particular images from. And the second collection is from Inish Murray. And uh, both of those um, sketchbooks of, of, of uh, those sketchbooks of watercolors 
Um, they were owned by Marquery Castle and they're now in the research library in Sligo. But some really, really fascinating photographs. And what's also interesting about this is this is the time um, when Wood Martin is excavating in Carrowmore. And Wakeman was there for quite a few Wood Martin's excavations. Um, his illustrations were used for many of Wood Martin's illustrations in his books. They were um, engraved. But I found a quote by Wakeman and he was saying that he didn't think that photography could handle these um, monuments and it had to be done by a sensitive artist. So it's pretty interesting that Wakeman's trade of illustrating monuments was just, he was on the threshold where photography was becoming much more popular and he was kind of, I guess you could say fighting against um, photography. This is a, a monument in Carrowmore that not so many people get to visit. It's monument number 36, which is down to the south of Carrowmore, the only monument that's not in the townland of Carrowmore as well. And you can see the second stone circle over there on the left, and that is circle number 32 in Carrowmore. Another one, again, they're both on private property, not part of the monuments owned by the OPW, so not too many people would get to visit them. But Wakeman's pictures are really interesting because there's not so many trees in these photographs as there would, or in these illustrations as there would be now, so you're getting to see the landscape um, in a kind of a different form. The stone walls are all quite a bit taller in these illustrations than they are currently as well. This is the same monument and this one is photographed by Green, so this would be about 1910. So that's the same monument which is number 36. It's listed here as actually number 37, but I think it's 36. It's one 36 or 37 anyway. Um, that's a fine little chamber. One of the interesting things looking back at these photographs is that the monuments actually seem to be quite a bit better cared for back at that time um, than they do now because I went down last year to photograph this monument which is on private land. Um, I photographed all the monuments in Carrowmore and compared them to the photographs from 1896 and 1910 and in general the monuments looked like they were in better condition, they were less overgrown, um, they were easier to see um, but also this one at the moment, you can't see it, it's completely covered by a heap of briars, so there's no view from it at all, so it's kind of neglected nowadays, so, as I say, it's on private property. That's one of Green's photographs from 1910. We're back to 1886 here, or 1896, and this is uh, Monument 13 at Carrowmore. This one is just beside the main road, so it's the first monument most people see coming to Carrowmore, and this monument was hit by a car was a car crash there in 1985 and the capstone was actually dislodged off the monument and it was restructured or restored somewhat by the Swedish archaeologists but it has almost collapsed back down to the same position it was but anyway that's what it looked like in 1896 and you can see the stone wall here again so you have the um, the road running from Carrowmoor back down to um, Sligo just over that stone wall and there are several large boulders in that wall as well, which would be the, the stones from the stone circle, which was demolished uh, when the wall was built. You can just see Nochnare over here on the left as well. This one here is another one of Green's photographs. And again, like I was saying, if you can see them down the bottom right hand corner, you'll see the, the initials of whoever took the photograph. And again, this one is pretty interesting. This is um, Monument 52 at Carrowmore. Um, <clears throat> it has the little chalk stone, which is still in position um, kind of lifting up the capstone and it also has the remains of a passageway um, over here on the left side of the photograph. Um, what is so interesting about this photograph is we can see there's a field clearance car just to the right of the monument there and uh, in more modern times um, I have heard people say that that cairn was the remains of the Stone Age cairn which was used to lift the stones up onto the monument but it's very obvious when you look back at some of these photographs that it's a field clearance cairn and not nearly as old as the monuments. Now this one is fascinating. This is the same monument from a different angle. So same dolmen, but now we are looking at it from the front. So you can see the little chalk stone is still here in position. And what is really fascinating to me about this monument is the ground level is quite a bit lower around it than it is today now. So that field clearance cairn that you can see there on the left hand side, that's all a grass covered mound now. But what is really interesting is this stone wall over here to the right. And when they tidied up Carrowmore back in the late 1990s and the early noughties, um, to restore the central monument, they dismantled all of the stone walls in Carrowmore. Now those walls had been built in the 1830s, 
and some of them Petrie was quite upset when he was um, recording Caramore for the first time because he saw some of the stones being smashed to build field walls. So that field wall was probably built around 1837 or 1838. But when the wall was dismantled, I think it was maybe in 2002 or 2003, they discovered the chamber of another monument just up to the right of where this young man is standing. There is um, another chamber now. You can also see Queen Mavis Cairn as well um, up on the top of Knocknaray in the background. And that is a view that is almost gone from Carrowmore at the moment because there are a lot of sycamore trees surrounding a house just over the hill there. So during the summer, when we're giving guided tours from that monument, you, you can see it for the first couple of months, but when the leaves come on the trees, the view to Queen Maeve's Cairn up in Knocknaray disappears. So all kinds of interesting things to, to find out in these pictures. This is another one of my favorite photographs. And I have a lot of them in here. Um, this is one by Green. So again, this is from 1910. And this is Monument 53. Uh, I think we call it 54 nowadays. It's the first monument that we bring people to on the tours in Carol Moore. It's a very small, fairly damaged looking monument. And again, the, the stone circle was removed to build field walls. But what you can see here is the plowing, the extent of the plowing going on in the background. And I remember um, reading, I think it was in Wood Martin, he talked about how a landowner in Carrowmore complained to his landlord back in the 1840s and he said that there were many there were so many human remains in the ground um, that he was renting that he was afraid that his potatoes were going to taste greasy from all the human remains so you can see the kind of plowing that was going on here and the potatoes being planted around the monument so that's quite a photograph I think this here is another one of Wakeman's so this one would date back to about 1879 and we're looking at circles 56 and 57 here. And I've always wondered about how we managed to get this perspective because he's actually looking uphill. This is at the back of the visitor center when the, you follow the path up the hill, you see these two stone circles and 57 here is the largest circle remaining in Carroll Moor. And it now has a large sycamore tree growing in it. And again, you can see in Wakeman's time, the tree was quite small, but this view is very, very hard to get. It's almost like he must have looked from the roof of the cottage or something like that because when you're on the ground looking at these monuments, you're way, way down below them and they're on the hill above you. So he may have been taking some kind of liberty there. These are the same two monuments um, and this is Welsh. So we're back to 1896 here. So in the foreground, you have the chamber of number 56, which is sitting on its platform. And then you have the stone circle in the background of number 57, which is the largest circle remaining in Carrowmore. And Again, the colorization gives you some kind of a hint of the landscape as well, but you can see there are not so many trees as there are now in Carol Moore. So the views were substantially better, I suppose, back in those days. And you can see the three young gentlemen again here sitting on the stones. One of them was in one of the earlier photographs. And it's something I will do when I get back to Carol Moore is trying to find out more about these people because you can find out from the um, census records who was living in the cottages at the time the photographs were taken. So these would be the young lads from the local houses taking the photographer on a tour of the monuments. Uh, that's one of Wakeman's sketches and that's one of his pictures that was turned into an engraving. So this is a gentleman sitting at Listoffel, the large monument at the centre of Carol Moore. You can see a few of the curb stones from the monument here around the edge as well and you can see that monument we just saw, number 52, the one with the boy standing on the wall, you can see over here behind, and Queen Maeve's Cairn up on the hill again. So that's what happened to many of Wakeman's illustrations. They were engraved or etched to be used as photographs for books or illustrations for books. This one I just threw in just this evening. I, I found this one a while ago online. That's a postcard of um, number seven at Carol Moore, the Kissing Stone. And one of the things I found interesting was neither Welsh or Green tended to focus on the mountain in the background. And most people when they're in Carol Moore, they really like to try and get Queen Maeve's Cairn in the background into the photographs. And Welsh and Green didn't do that. They focused more on the monuments in front of them. So this, I don't know what date this postcard is from, but um, possibly the 1930s, but you can see it looks like a colorized black and white photograph as well. That's the kissing stone again. Now, this is a picture of Clover Hill, and this one is by George Elcock. Um, sculpted stones, assisted Caramore Sligo, Clover Hill, um, August 1889. So it's on the same trip, more than likely, where he painted that original picture with the, the little hobbit person in it. And there are quite a few other 
uh, illustrations of the stones at Clover Hill um, in the National Library. I found quite a few of them researching in there last year online. So uh, Clover Hill was quite a popular monument because of the megalithic art. It was a place that people really liked to visit and it was considered really, really famous back in the Victorian times, where strangely enough nowadays it's hardly known really. Um, quite strange. But that's, um, as I say, that's Elcock again, and that's a little bit more of an expressionist kind of a picture. There's quite a difference between his style and Wakeman's. That is Green's photograph of the same monument, and you can see that they probably bought the chalk with them to highlight the carvings on the rocks here as well. So you can see the carvings have been highlighted with white chalk. And again, Clover Hill is actually looking quite a bit better then than it looks now. It was cleaned, I think, maybe last year or the year before, but it had become completely overgrown and covered with briars, so quite hard to find. So they do seem to have been taken uh, better care of in the Victorian times than sometimes they would appear to be taken care of nowadays. This is another photograph by Robert Welsh, possibly from... Um, 1896, and this is Queen Maeve's cairn up on top of Knock Naray. Now I did find researching last year in the newspapers that the Belfast Antiquarian Society or the Belfast Field Club came down on a field trip to Sligo in 1896. So Green, or sorry, Welsh may have been along on that trip and um, taking these photographs at that time because they visited Carrowmore, they visited the Glen at Knock Naray, and um, some of them certainly climbed the mountain and visited Queen Maeve's cairn. So one of the smaller monuments here you can see in the foreground, you can see the large standing stone. And again, there's nearly always a person or two in these photographs, which gives a great sense of scale. So that is Welch's photograph of Queen Maeve's Cairn from 1896. Now back to Wakeman again. Uh, this monument here is Heapstown Cairn down by Loch Arrow. And this is from his sketchbook again. The, the Great Cairn of Heapstown, County Sligo, drawn on the spot for Colonel Cooper, who was the Colonel from um, Cooper's Hill at the time, October 26th, 1878, by William F. Wakeman. Uh, one of the interesting things about this picture of Heapstown is you can see the standing stone, which used to be on the summit. It was still there at the time. There's an earlier engraving of Heapstown by Petrie as well from the 1830s. And again, he illustrated a standing stone up on top of the monument. And again, the trees had not been planted around Heapstown at the time. It's surrounded by mature sweet chestnut trees now at the moment. So um, very interesting to see its, its date in uh, 1878. And it hadn't been too badly quarried at the time either. You can see one big quarry hole on this side for sure, but it doesn't look to be in too bad condition. So a few more of Wakeman's illustrations coming up. This is an intriguing one. Um, I'm living in Cliffany village. Um, up in North Sligo. And we have quite a few monuments around us here in Cliffany, but not too many passage graves. But this one here is the Ruin Cairn and Circle um, near Finner Camp, 27 feet in diameter is the circle. And there's a large cairn behind. I think the cairn is about 30 or 35 meters in diameter. So this monument is completely gone now. There has been a paper written about it as far as I know, but you can see the little entrance leading into it as well, but you are certainly looking at a passage grave that is more now destroyed. It's in the sand hills um, in the Finner army camp. Um, it's still up in the same area. This is the giant's grave in Bundorn. It's at Maharakar and it is a passage grave. And this monument is currently falling into the sea. Quite a bit of it is gone. Um, it was excavated, I think in the 1970s or the 1980s, uh, if the 90s even by Eamon Cody did a rescue activation there and a report has been published but it's a kind of um, an undifferentiated passage grave so it's pointing out towards um, the mountains across the bay so that's quite a nice image anyway as well and that one is by Green. Uh, here's another one of Wakeman's. Um, this is Deer Park and as you can see the interesting thing about this is all three lintels are in position so again, that's from around 1878, 18, 1879. You can see the cracked lintel over here, which is in pretty good condition. Um, we'll come back to that in a, in a few moments, uh, another picture or two of Deer Park, but that is quite a nice illustration by William Wakeman. Oh, here they are. Um, this is the same monument photographed by William Green. Um, now I don't have dates for a lot of his photographs. You would have to get their, um, their, their notebooks, which are in the Belfast Museum to find out when the photographs were taken because they must have made a lot of journeys around the country. But for anybody who's familiar with Deer Park, 
you will know that that stone is not quite as um, in quite as good condition. It's collapsed quite a bit more, the crack in the lintel. And uh, interesting to see the nettles growing in the chamber there as well. And this one is really interesting. This is by Green again, and this is the triathlon in the south chamber at Deer Park. The reason this one is so interesting is because this stone is now lying on the ground. And I read somewhere, I can't remember where, that it was pushed over in 1922. So strangely enough, some of these monuments um, were only vandalized in recent years. Um, it's amazing to think that they lasted for 5,000 or so years, only for late 19th century, early 20th century people to decide to have a go at them. So that um, large lintel stone now is lying on the ground outside the chamber and seemingly it was pushed over deliberately in 1922 or so. Now this one here is, a, is an image that um, I've been fascinated by for a long, long time. I did a project on the Wakeman watercolours um, for Sligo County Library back about 15 years ago and they gave me copies of them. And as part of the project was to go and try and visit the monuments and re-photograph them from a modern perspective and see how things had changed. And this is one of the mystery photographs in the collection because it was quite hard to figure out where it was. I don't know if anybody recognises it, but it's actually Creevy Keel, which is my local monument here in Sligo. And the capstone over the doorway at Creevy Keel, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Creevy Keel is a very easy site to visit. Um, the capstone at Creevy Keel was pushed over by three local brothers, I think they were Hannans, in 1895. And somebody just told me recently in Cliffany that they pushed it over as a bet to see if they could do it. So that stone had been standing for the guts of 5,000 years, <laughs> and it's pushed over around 1895 for a bet. So when the American archaeologists came along in the 1930s, um, Hugh Henkin O'Neill and the Harvard um, archaeologists, and excavated at Creevy Keel, the locals all told them that the capstone within living memory had been standing up over the doorway. Henkin didn't believe them and they put the capstone back flat the way it is now at the moment. So it was restored in 1935, 40 years after it was pushed over, but it was restored lying down instead of standing up. And the one thing anybody who visit, has visited Creevy Keel will know is it's a very easy place to crack your head when you're going into the chamber because that capstone is about five feet long and there's a lip on the top of it, which is actually illustrated here in Wakeman's um, drawing. And that tends to always catch people. When you're going into Creevy Keel Chamber, you need to go down. Just when you think it's safe to stand up, that's when you have to duck even further down. So that is pretty fascinating to see that's Creevy Keel for, um, illustrated from inside the chamber. The other interesting thing about this illustration is uh, in Wood Martin's um, Rootstone Monuments, he mixed this illustration up, or the engraver mixed it up, with another monument in Cliffany called Cartron Plank. So the monument got mislabeled, and for years and years people have been trying to figure out how the, how you know this could be Cartron Plank, which is not. It's actually Creevy Keel, but it's Creevy Keel before the stone was pushed over. So that is a fascinating photograph. Now we're on to 1911, and we're up as far as Carroll Keel. So this is. Um, and Carol Keel is one of the reasons I came to Sligo. I, I moved to Sligo and uh, I ended up living quite close to Carol Keel. And when I lived, it's how I became a tour guide because nobody really knew anything about the place. And there was lots of visitors used to come looking for information and they would often get sent to me and they'd say, go up and talk to him. He knows a fair bit about it. Um, the only information you could get about Carol Keel at the time was McAllister's 1911 report. Well, the excavations took place in 1911 and the report uh, came out in 1912. So, um, McAllister, Prager, Armstrong and McAllister's father, Alexander McAllister, excavated there uh, on three different occasions over the summer and autumn of 1911. And on their second visit, they invited William Green to come along and take photographs. So this here is a photograph of what they call the old gate in the report. It's a large erratic stone that you'll pass on your way up to Carroll Keel, and it's looking across to what they were calling Gorman's Cairn, which was the old name for Cairn B. So that's the train scrabble, and that's the Loch Vale Valley. So there's a picture of the Bowl McAllister himself. They're just after opening Cairn B, uh, which is called Gorman's Cairn at the time. And again, it's fascinating the amount of information you can find in these pictures because this was their second visit to Carroll Keel, and they had a bit of trouble finding the entrance to Cairn G and Cairn K, pitching ragged lumps of limestone, as they would have said. 
So you can actually see in this photograph here, the way the workmen have been working their way around the top of the cairn and pitching out stones. So you can see there's kind of a, a groove in the side of the cairn here until they find the entrance. And McAllister had spent time in Palestine. He had spent time opening ancient mounds and things like that. He liked to work hard and work fast. So there was a kind of almost like a vandalistic kind of a sense to it all. They were just mad to get into the monuments, but they had figured out that the monuments were generally not at ground level, the openings to them. And you can see this one here in particular in Carroquil, that the chamber of that cairn is about eight feet above the surrounding ground level. So it's been quite elevated. So they managed to find it um, handily enough anyway. So that's McAllister sitting on top of the, the freshly opened Gorman's cairn. And that's it just after they had opened it. That's the entrance to the Great Cairn in Carrowkeel, County Sligo. Another one of Green's photographs. And again, the colorization tends to bring up a lot of details. And you can see how wet the rocks are while they're here. And you can see the pickaxe handle has actually got wet marks on it as well. So it must have been raining fairly heavily while they were there as well. They do mention that um, some of the rain made the work hard uh, on their third visit. And it also looks quite muddy heading into that cairn as well. That's the monument where Robert Hensey discovered a piece of megalithic art back in 2009. Now, this is Cairn E in Carrowkeel, which is quite an unusual monument. It seems to be a mixture of a passage grave cairn. So we're looking here into the, uh, into the passage grave, you could say. You're looking into the passageway and there's a cyst or um, a kind of a small side chamber on each side. And this monument had been open for a long, long time when they came. The roof had been gone off it for a long time. That's another photograph from a slightly different angle of the same chamber. And again, you can see these large flags over here on the right, which are covering the small cyst. And you can see in some of these photographs as well, you might be able to make out over there on the left is um, Pregar's walking stick. So he, these are posing in the photograph himself for a scale, or he leaves his walking stick in some of them for a scale as well. So there we go. That's the cyst in the northern end of Carney at Carrowkeel. That's Karen H in Carrowkeel. And this is another monument has an interesting history. It was the only monument in Carrowkeel that was open in 1911. There was actually an entryway that you could see going in, but about eight feet in, they discovered one of the orthostats had leaned in and fallen in, so they couldn't get into the passage or the chamber. So they cut down through the roof, they tunneled through and um, shoved out tons and tons of stone. And for this reason, they left the monument in such a state that for, for years and years afterwards, when I moved to Carrowkeel, I was always told that this was the monument that McAllister had blown up. And people considered he had bought dynamite up and blown up the monument because he left it in such shocking condition. Um, I could talk for quite a bit of time about this one, but I, I won't go into too much detail. But I think for my own money, this monument is the focal monument or the central monument at Carroll Moor. And one of the reasons I was always puzzled by it was McAllister gives the dimensions of this monument as being 100 feet in diameter or about 30 meters in diameter. It's got two curbs. So what you're actually looking at here is a platform and a cairn sitting on the platform. And at the center, you had a stone box, something like the stone monument in Carroll Moor, and you had a passageway pointing towards Knocken Array. And at some stage that was altered and the passageway has a kink or a bend, and now it points towards the sunset at the summer solstice. So the cairn beside it, Cairn G in Carrowkeel, has a kind of a roof box or an opening that points towards the same direction. But Frank Pendergast now has said that this monument is aligned towards the summer solstice sunset. So two monuments in Carrowkeel with alignments. That is a, a plan, an elevation and a section of Karen G um, beside Karen H and Carol Keel. So just an example of the kind of um, draftsmanship, uh, etc., that McAllister and Pragar did, which there really are lovely drawings. You're looking at the end of the antiquarian era here, really the last antiquarians. And when the Harvard um, archaeologists come in the 1930s, that kind of takes Ireland out of a kind of a Victorian kind of way of looking at monuments and into a much more scientific way. But these are pretty, pretty amazing um, images of Carol Keel. And as I said, these were all you could really, if you could get your hands on them, you were doing well. But this was all the information there was about Carol Keel back in the late 1990s. That's one of the photographs of that burial chamber there. So I'm just going to go back and show you. You can see over here on the bottom right hand corner, you can see the section of the passage and chamber and the two large orthostats and the entrance in at the back. So you're looking at the photograph of the same thing here the interior of Cairn G in Carrowkeel in 1911. This is Cairn K, and this is another monument that McAllister and company had a bit of trouble finding the entrance to. 
they say they started digging up on the right of the monument up here and they started pitching stones out and they worked their way around until they found the entrance. So not as much damage as you find at Cairn G, or sorry, Cairn B, but still quite a bit of damage to that monument as well. Uh, there was lots and lots of quartz on this monument over the years, even back in the late 1990s, but it's nearly all been taken now by souvenir hunters, the same as happening at Queen Maeve's Cairn. Anyway, that's the monument that had just been opened at the time. And that is the view looking the other way out from the, the, the chamber and through the passage. Um, you can see that there's flagstones covering the floor and you can also see sill stones, which they're, they're somewhat buried in the rubble inside the monument now. But again, quite a fascinating um, image of the interior of the monument, not long after I'd been opened for the first time since the Bronze Age. Um, here are two end recesses together. The one on the left is the end recess in Cairn K in Carrow Keel and has a cracked lintel, some badly cracked lintels here, but they are much worse now and not being helped by people climbing on the monuments either. I must get a modern photograph of this and um, just check and see how much, how badly the monument has subsided since then. So you're looking at two end recesses, Cairn K on the left and Cairn G on the right. So it just gives you an idea of the kind of the structure um, the limestone kind of um, building techniques used in Carrow Keel. That's the belt, uh, Prager himself with his walking stick. So Prager was the person who discovered or rediscovered the Carrow Keel monuments. He was up surveying in 1896. He was cataloging orchids in the area. And again, 1896, a lot of things seem to be going on. That's when the Belfast Field Club came down on their tour. Uh, Prager was a member of that field club, by the way, um, and he knew Welsh and Green quite well. This here is the cyst um, beside Cairn K. That's what a stone cyst, Carrow Keel Mountain. And you can see Cairn K just up on the top right over here. So you get a nice view of the, the kind of the Victorian gentleman here. And this monument, the lid had been recently smashed. So you're looking at some kind of a stone box like Listochel in Carrow Moor. It has a movable door stone here in the front end and the orientation is towards not an array, and you can see the smashed pieces of the lid around it. And one of the ways you would know that this monument had not been opened too long before Prager's visit is that the stones haven't started weathering. So the, the, the large slabs of stone around the edges here are not weathered, maybe just over 100, 120 years. So I would imagine that that box was entered maybe in the 1860s or the 1870s. Um, this is Cairn F, the largest of the Cairns in Carroll Keel. And again, there's quite a bit of damage done here by McAllister and Prager. And that's Prager sitting up on the monument before they started digging. And you might be able to see there's a large capstone here, which it gave them a bit of trouble. Um, this is the same monument again. You can see on the left-hand photograph here, the doorway or the entry into the chamber. And this door was about the size of the entryway into Newgrange. It was five, five and a half feet high. Uh, quite a regular doorway leading into uh, a monument with five recesses. So in many of the passage graves you find in Sligo, you'll find three recesses, recesses, one to the left, one to the right, and an end recess. You had double recesses in Carnef. They weren't able to get in and clean out the chamber on their first visit because this large capstone, the, the, the capstone of the whole monument, was um, hanging over it. So on their next visit, they came back and they got laborers with sledgehammers to smash that capstone and um, then they tunnel down into the chamber. And the picture here on the right is a photograph taken by McAllister on the second visit. Now, one of the fascinating things about this chamber here in Carnef is it's one of only two monuments in Ireland that has a standing stone in the chamber. The other is Carnell up in La Cru. And in this photograph here, they have um, cleared out the chamber completely. They've stacked all the loose rubble into the, the two front recesses and they have re-erected the fallen standing stone and you can see there's some timber props holding it up. And the pillar stone is about four and a half feet high, seemed to have been broken deliberately back in the Stone Age because um, cremated human remains were found spread on the stump. So some kind of an act of um, Stone Age vandalism seems to have taken place here. So this is a, a really magnificent monument. It has a huge chamber. I think the ceiling of this chamber, they estimated was maybe 17, 18 feet above floor level, and they recognized that the stone was freestanding as well. But the intriguing thing about this is, this is one of McAllister's photographs. And he took a set of photographs himself um, during these excavations. And this is the only photograph we have a copy of. And this one I found in an old archeology span book by Joseph Raftery from um, the 1950s. 
So absolutely fascinating, Karen Neff and Carol Keel. There is the um, Dunavira Mountain. You've got Karen O and Karen P in the summit, and you have the plateau over here where all the hut sites are. And these hut sites were discovered and surveyed by Petrie and McAllister back at this time as well. I think they found 40 hut sites back during their original survey. It's since been resurveyed by Stefan Berg, and I think the number is something like 153 house foundations there now. Now, I'm coming towards the end of just a few more pictures from around the county. Um, this is one of uh, Wakeman's from his collection, and this is the Giant's Griddle over in Tana Truffon over, um, over beyond Iski, in the Iski River Valley, up towards the Ox Mountains. And it's one of the most beautiful of the dolmens in Sligo. And you can kind of see what Wakeman is talking about when he reckons that some of these monuments are nearly too sensitive to be photographed. I don't particularly agree with him, but he really does capture the essence of some of these monuments um, in his illustrations. So that's the Giant's Griddle in the local folklore. Finn McCool in the Fina used it as a cooking place, uh, a griddle stone, and all the dolmens over in that area tend to be called griddles. Um, this is a photograph that's taken, I'd imagine, from up um, Maharao Grange area. But the reason I included it was because there seems to be a pre-bog forest here. You can see the stumps of lots and lots of possibly pine trees here in the middle of all the bog. So that's one of Green's photographs um, from maybe 1910, 1920. We don't have a date for them, but just a pretty interesting photograph of the landscape. Again, not many trees um, in Ireland at that time at all. Uh, this is another one I'm very fond of. This is by Welsh, um, so possibly the 1890s. And this is the Cullinamore Oyster Middens. And again, it'd be fascinating to find out who the young lady who he got to come and pose was. The colours during the colourisation process were picked randomly. So they tend to go for these kind of blues and, 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 and dark colours, but it seems to be a school uniform. But uh, quite an interesting photograph of the middens as they were back at that stage. And just to finish off, I have a few photographs here from Inish Murray. So this is one of Wakeman's mm -hmm. illustrations at Inish Murray from 1881. And that is the altar beg, I think it's called. It's at the back of the men's church of Inish Murray. This is a picture by Green of the, um, oh, this is altar beg. Um, and you can see some of the cursing stones around it and the smaller stones. You can see Malash's chapel in the background. And this is the one, I think somebody used to call it DNA cross. And this monument, this cross is actually broken now, um, but it seems to have been intact back at that time. This is a fabulous photograph of the, the famous cursing stones or the Cluck Bracca on Inish Murray. And one of the things I find so interesting about this is it's got a different set of cross slabs on it now than it does back at that stage. And this cross is now in the women's graveyard. Um, it's on St. Mary's altar. And I'm not sure what this little cross is here, but um, they, the Board of Works did up Finnish Murray back in the 1880s and seemingly the locals were horrified, absolutely horrified by what was going on because this was their graveyard and they didn't really appreciate the Board of Works coming in tidying it up. So it's very interesting when you look through their pictures of Finnish Murray, you will find that not everything then, things have changed quite a bit since that time. And this is uh, the sweat house at Inish Murray. And again, in all the Inish Murray pictures, you find um, the same people in them. So this little gentleman here is in several of the pictures. He's got bare feet and he's also wearing a skirt. He's a boy who's wearing a skirt. And that's that whole tradition about the fairies um, stealing little boys or whatever. But some people say it's just, it was convenient as well for nappy training or all kinds of different ideas about it. But you do often find um, the boys wearing skirts in these earlier photographs. So that is the photograph by uh, Robert Welsh, and that is of the Sweat House, uh, Chock and Olish, just outside the wall of the castle on Inish Murray. Now this one may not be so familiar to people. I'm just going to go back and just look at your little Sweat House here. Look at the little the lintel stone over the doorway, and you have a kind of a stone hut over the, the Sweat House. This is at Scarden, just out by the turn off to Coney Island, and there were three holy wells out at Scarden. I think St. Bridget, St. Patrick and St. Colin Kill. You find the same thing in Castle Baldwin. There were three holy wells in Castle Baldwin as well. St. Bridget, St. Patrick and Colin Kill. But these are now gone. The road was widened. But the interesting thing about them is there may have been some kind of a little stone well house, almost like the beehive in this picture 
over the holy wells here. There seems to have been the remains of some kind of a stone beehive. And reading Wood Martin, um, he talks about the holy well here in Cliffany, St. Bridget's Well in Cliffany. And he says back in the 1880s, St. Bridget's Well in Cliffany was also covered by a small stone beehive or well house. But that one was pretty fascinating and it took a while to identify it. Um, you can see Knocknaray in the background, but I think it was Damien Brennan actually identified it originally um, on, a, on a Facebook group a couple of years ago. It's probably the photograph that got me interested in this whole project of looking at these old pictures of monuments and trying to figure out where they were. And now this is my last slide, just to bring us a bit more back up to date. That is a photograph by Green, and that is at the High Altar in Sligo Abbey. And what is so interesting is you have this um, this figure, which I'm not sure if that is still around or if it's been stolen or if it's been set in the wall somewhere, but you have this, um, this, this little figure of Christ who looks almost like a superhero. He's wearing a cloak um, up there on the high altar. Okay, that's nearly an hour of me talking. That concludes our, our tour through of, Ty of Sligo through, um, through time and space. So I'm gonna hand you back to Martin and Sally. Yeah, um, Sally, um...